Welcome, Marys. Welcome. No, your eyes are not deceiving you. I do have on the same shirt. Yes. <laughs> Come on in. Come on, Marys. Join us. Marys on the replay. Listening to Isabel Davis, Wide as the Sky. I love that, how she says, Jesus, take your place. Holy Ghost, take your place. No one else is worthy. That's what we should be saying all the time. Take your place, God. Take your place, which is first in our lives. All right, Marys. So welcome to another Tuesday of the Battlefield of Mind. And like I said, no, your eyes are not deceiving you. If you just watched the previous recording, I do have on the same clothes and my co-host, Evangelist Keisha and Sister Arthur, they have on the same tops too. So why are we coming to you double? Because we will not be there live when you're watching this. This is a pre-recorded lesson and we did not want to leave you for that week without anything. So we are looking forward to coming to you tonight with chapter 12. But before we go into that, for those of you that may be new and this may be your first time tuning in to a video, this is his ministry, Heart in Submission, where we minister to the heart, mind, and the soul of the woman. We encourage healing, deliverance, restoration, personal and spiritual growth through biblical study. The foundational scripture that we stand on is Psalms 51, which is created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. We are taking it chapter by chapter, question by question, in this book by Joyce Meyer, The Battlefield of the Mind. Feel free to go back and review all the previous lessons that we have reviewed, and you will see it not only by the chapter, but you'll also see it by the date to make sure that you're getting all of the lessons. So, like I stated earlier, we are moving into chapter 12, An Anxious and worried mind. We just finished up a doubtful and unbelieving mind, and now we're moving into this. So without further ado, we are going to jump right into this. We are going to open up in prayer, and then we are going to do a brief recap of chapter 11, the last two questions that we, um, the, the last two sections of questions that we had went over, and then Evangelist will lay out this first part for you in chapter 12. All right, so my dear sister, do you want to go ahead and open us up in prayer? Okay, I think we're having a little bit of technical difficulty with my sister. So I'm going to go ahead and open us up in prayer. If you would just bring your hearts and your mind in for a moment. 
Lord, we thank you for another opportunity just to come before you, just to sit at your feet to be Mary's God. We just exhale from the day, Lord. We take off the cares. We take off the worries. We take over the thoughts of being overwhelmed. We take over, take off everything that may be a distraction or a hindrance, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just come to you. We repent, Father, for any sins of omission or commission, God. We ask that you will give us a clear mind, Father. Give us ears to hear your voice clearly tonight, God. Begin to reveal those things that we need to uproot, we need to pluck out, God. Bless us to be honest with ourselves and take inventory, God. Lord, bless us to continue to trust you, God, that we will continue to grow and operate in our faith, God. We thank you, Father, for loving us enough, God, to continue to correct us, to continue to set us free, to continue to give us deliverance and healing, God. We thank you, Father, for just being our father, our strong tower. We can do nothing without you. So Lord, we ask that you will bless each and every woman as a part of his ministry, those that are to come. God, we thank you that they will grow spiritually. We thank you, Father, for new testimonies, new victories, God. We thank you that they are walking with their full armor of God this day, God, that it is fortified in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. All right, so ladies, let's go ahead and jump right into the recap from last week. And Sister Arthurlyn, you want to go ahead and begin the recap? Good evening, Marys. So let us go ahead and recap from last week, number eight, A through E. And the first question um stated, according to the scripture, we as believers can enter the rest of God. But let me just back up a little bit. Um, the scripture is coming from Hebrews 4 and 11, and I'll just read that for you real quickly here. Let us therefore be zealous and exert ourselves and strive diligently to enter that rest of God, to know and experience it for ourselves that no one may fall or perish by the same kind of unbelief and disobedience into which those in the wilderness fail. And so again, AA asked the question, according to the scripture, we as believers can enter into the rest of God. And we expounded a little bit on that um, Back in the Old Covenant, the Sabbath was observed as a day of rest. And under the New Covenant, the Sabbath rest spoke of a spiritual place of rest where the believer can abide. And we stated that the spiritual rest that God has given us today is the ultimate rest, where we can refuse to be wearied or anxious for anything. We can just rest in him and give all to him. But the key thing is to believe and not be an unbeliever like those in the wilderness. So that's the question A. And B says the entire fourth chapter of the book of Hebrews speaks about the Sabbath rest in which we just explained spiritual rest. No longer are we speaking of the physical rest in the old covenant, the spiritual rest of God, where we can just be in his presence, just lying there, allowing him to fully saturate us with his love, his grace, and his mercy. And C says, how does the Sabbath under the new covenant differ from the Sabbath, Sabbath under the old covenant? And we stated again, under the old covenant, the Sabbath was a day of rest. And under the new covenant, the emphasis is on spiritual rest. And D goes on to say, how do we enter spiritual rest? And we just stated through believing and not doubting. 
in spite of what you may see, in spite of what you may come across, the devil and his tactics, of course, he's going to come against us at every cost. He's going to throw low blows, but we have to be focused, continue to believe and have that believing heart and not give in to that wilderness mentality and turning against God and what he has preordained. We want to continue to believe in him and trust that trust in him at all costs never doubting never being an unbeliever and the last question e is how do we forfeit it through unbelief and disobedience unbelief and disobedience we don't want to be like the children of israel we want to continue to be absorbed in god's mercy and allow him to give us that spiritual rest, that rest that is the ultimate rest. Nothing can compare to the rest that God can give us when we are believing in him fully with a whole heart, a pure heart, trusting no matter what in God and all that he can and will do for us. So that covers eight a through E, and I'll give it to Minister Sarah to go through nine. What is going on? Thank you, this is the Arthur. I encourage you all to go back and really listen to the replay where they really broke that down even more regarding the Sabbath rest and the spiritual rest and the input that evangelists gave uh, regarding having your own Sabbath and just having that time to be still before God and where you can have God just really begin to speak to you and just reverence that, that time with him, be before him and keeping it holy. Um, she really broke that down and we actually really spoke to that a little bit more from what Sister Arthur just went over. So go back and listen to it so you can get even more of the meat. She just gave you a little brief recap, just enough to get you to say, let me go back and hear the rest of that. <laughs> so go back and watch the replay so you can get the meat of that. Um, with nine and how we ended out the chapter, we went with scripture of Romans 1 and 17, where it was, for then in righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So we talked about how the just are supposed to live, which is by faith. We talked about what the meaning of faith is again. We know that what the scripture talks about. The faith is ever the things of hope for those things of not seen. I think I messed that scripture up, but forgive me. But we talked about it being complete trust or confidence in someone or something, basically having complete confidence and trust in God and how we can grow in our faith. And we went over some of the examples of the different people from the Bible that were tested in their faith and how they grew in their faith and how we are to keep our eye on God like a flint and that's how we are to live by faith and that you can't have joy and peace and be living in unbelief and doubt oil and water don't mix you you you, you can't and if you are portraying that you're putting on fakeness you're being fake about it because your fruit will not be evident of that you will have some rotten, spoiled fruit um, when you really, in your heart, have unbelief and doubt. But on the outside, you try to make it seem like it's joy and peace. That fruit will not be ripe. It will not be good fruit. And we also talked about how we should avoid hmm, having a double mind because we we read the scripture with James 1 and 7, 8, when it talks about a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So we talked about how we can make the choice and be intentional 
not to have a double mind and areas that we can also be intentional of when we know we're dealing with unbelief and doubt by looking for the root, by going before the Lord and asking him to show us these areas, asking to be set free, healed and delivered in this area. We talked about those ways of being set free that we don't have to have a double mind. We don't have to be unstable. When we become aware, we recognize it, we have an out. God has given us a get out of bondage card and we can apply it as we are becoming aware in different areas of our life. But you have to make the choice. We also mentioned and went over thoroughly the scripture of 2 Corinthians when it tells us what are we supposed to do when we are living in unbelief and doubt and you know, we're not even really living by faith and, you know, we're having that double minded. We went over second Corinthians 10 and five, where it said we should refute arguments, theories, reasonings, every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. So we talked about that as saying, look at that scripture, ask the Lord to show you if there's any area that you're weak in? Is there an area where you need to refute that maybe you have it with those arguments, those theories, those reasonings? Evangelist spoke to that even more so. We can't give you everything in the recap because there will be no reason for you to go back and really get the meat of it. But this is just a little bit for you to continue to not waver, but to continue to be strong in your faith, not have it watered down by doubt and unbelief not allowing that to turn into negativity, not allowing that to harden your heart, not allowing that to buffet everything that you know to be true, the true knowledge of God and where he's bought you from, where he's taking you to, not allowing that to take you back on the battlefield, but allow for you to be victorious by overcoming this way of thinking, thinking, being a winner, being a victorious, as you are forging your way forward on the battlefield of the mind. And as you win these battles, as we're going through these different conditions of the mind, you'll be able to look back and see how far you've come and that you have grown in maturity, that you have been given new tools so that anytime you see something like this trying to creep up sneak his way in or you're cut off guard that you know how to be able to fight it that you know how to remain free or get free so that is our recap from last week of concluding chapter 11 with question 8 and 9 we are excited to get into chapter 12 with an anxious and a worried mind again this is not no marathon we're taking our time we're breaking it down question by question. You are listening to us. Go through the scriptures. Pick up your word and go through the scriptures yourself and see what stands out to you. Write it down. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you as you are going through these questions? Don't just read through the book. Don't just listen to it on audio. Don't just hear us read to it. But Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me about this particular situation? How am I answering this question? Am I really being real? Don't go to the back of the book looking for answers. What is coming up in your spirit of how you're answering these questions? You don't get the benefit out of this unless you actually do your portion of it. And that's to be able to meditate, to be able to pray, to read the scripture, to be able to see how you can make it applicable to your everyday living. So, like I said, we are moving into chapter 12, an anxious and worried mind. And I am going to turn it over to Evangelist. Thank you, Minister Sarah. Yes, um, I did hear something that really just stood out to me. I hear a lot of things, actually. But I want to point out that the place that we are in this book, Mary's, um, as we, we're moving into chapter 12, we just uh, 
concluded chapter 11, a dapple and unbelieving mind. And as Minister Sarah said, we're moving into an anxious and wary mind, and that's chapter 12. But what stood out to me and that we want you to be very aware of in this uh, workbook study, The Battlefield of the Mind, we, were, we started with part one, and that was that consisted of seven chapters. And that was the importance of the mind. Okay, and now we're in part two and Minister Sarah said, be aware of the condition of your mind. We're in this part two, the conditions of the mind, which consists of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight chapters. And right now we're on chapter number 12, the anxious and wearied mind. That is a staple for where you need to identify yourself right now to, to go and do your assessment. Because you know we, at, at junctures at, or at certain points of this journey, we go back and we assess ourselves spiritually. We go back and assess our minds. We, we take our own inventory to see where we are. So right now we're in the conditions of the mind. That's this part of the book that we're in on this chapter 12. So what is the condition of your mind, Mary? Is it anxious and wearied, okay? And, and, and the thing about this book, because it is the battlefield of the mind, the mind is the field, you're going to hear so much about the mind and we don't, you, we don't want you to get, to get weary. We don't want you to get numb. We don't want you to look at each, chap each chapter as they're running into each other, but they are building on each other. And there's very specific things that you need to look at now. You know, chapter one, or the, the part one of the book, it was the importance of the mind. But right now, we're in the conditions of the mind. This is where you assess the condition of your mind. In part one, you were to assess the importance of the mind. Now, the conditions of the mind. What's going on with your mind? What's the condition of your mind as you do your assessment? And as we move into the remaining chapters in this part of the book, but on this chapter 12, an anxious and weird mind. I just wanted to put that out there, Mary, so that we could just kind of stop. We can kind of stop and say, okay, what indeed is a condition of my mind? I moved out of the doubtful and unbelieving mind, that condition of the mind, literally a condition of the mind, now, is it an anxious and wearied mind? What does that look like? How do I overcome that? How do I truly assess that? Because whatever the condition of the mind, if it is not producing the byproducts of the fruit of the spirit, Galatians 5, 22 through 23, and it is operating in any of those things of the acts of the flesh, the sensual nature, or an anxious, which we're on in chapter 12, an anxious and wearied mind, what's the condition of your mind? It would then be abnormal as it relates to the way the Lord, the, our Father God wants our minds to operate, our control towers. What's the conditions of your control towers? Okay, so an anxious and, and, and wearied mind, chapter 12, we're on page 41 of the study guide, the battlefield of the mind, and we are on question number one. And that question number one, the scriptural references there are Psalms 37 and 8, Galatians 5 and 22, John 15 and 4, Matthew 6, 25 through 34, Philippians 4 and 6, First Peter 5 and 7. So this is just power packed with the word of God, just with this one question, okay? And this, the question has um, three parts to it. So it's A, B, and C, okay? And I am going to start out with, uh, of course, A, and it reads, what 
are anxiety and worry. It's asking us a question. Now, I just gave you the scriptural references, and I'm going to read the scriptures so that it speaks to what these, the, you know, the question actually is asking us. And the part A of that says, what are anxiety and worry? Well, attacks on the mind intended to distract us from serving the Lord. And that's what the author said. And when you think about Mary's anxiety and weary, in the beginning, you know, and throughout, we have spoken to clusters, which we call strongholds, okay? Demonic strongholds that cause us to be stagnated or operated, operate in, you know, evil forebodings or uh, mind-binding spirits. And anxiety and fear are definitely steeped in, you know, the super stronghold of fear. Anxiety and worry are steeped in the super stronghold of fear. What does that look like? Because the author spoke to that question what are anxiety and worry? And she said, attacks on the mind intended to distract us from serving the Lord, okay? Which is steeped in the super stronghold of fear. This is how it manifests itself, right? Okay. Fear of man, fear of authority, doubt and unbelief. We covered a uh, doubtful and unbelieving mind in the last chapter. Dread, then wary which is what we're speaking to now, anxiety, fear of the worst happening, fear of various illnesses like cancer, fear of people, uh, fear that people will get angry with us or they won't like us, the spirit of false responsibility, and a spirit of rush. Spirit of rush. So those are some of the, the clusters that are steeped in that super stronghold of fear and of which anxiousness and wary, anxiety and wary, are some of those clusters, those strongholds that manifest themselves in mind-binding spirits and evil forebodings that allows the enemy access to our minds to come in and attack our minds, which causes distraction and does what ultimately keep us from serving the Lord, takes us off task, keeps us from fulfilling our purposes and plans in the earth, the purposes and plans that God have designed for us in the earth, because ultimately it's not about us. But if he can keep us focused on us, then he can take us off task, which ultimately keeps us from serving the Lord. The enemy also uses both of these tormentors anxiety and weary to press our faith down okay and that's in the book and the author spoke to that but that stood out to me the enemy also uses both of these tormentors anxiety and weary to press our faith down so it cannot rise up and help us to live a victorious life we can't live in victory with, the, with evil forebodings and uh, mind-binding spirits of anxiousness and worry, which we said is uh, steeped in fear, a super stronghold of fear. Fear, look at fear as the gatekeeper of anxiety and worry. Why would you be anxious? Why would you be worried? Because of some of the things that were, were mentioned in that cluster of fear of you know a doubt and unbelief which we talked about last on the last chapter 11 fearing the worst thing would happen you know fearing illnesses or so on and so forth false responsibility and i think that can definitely happen to us and rush that can definitely happen to us marys when we're operating as martha's because of the responsibilities and cares of this world and others 
which is not a bad thing that we care and we love others and we want to do the will of God, but that thing can cross over and the lines can be blurred when we can't take out time to really focus on the true responsibilities that belong to us and that is fulfilling the purposes and plans of the Lord in the earth and that thing moving over into uh, being it's a burden and it's a yoke because the word says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light but when it moves from the the Lord's yoke and his burden burden for souls right the burden to see uh, individuals set free and delivered and living their best life the abundant life in Christ Jesus right that's a burden, right? And it's a yoke because that yoke then keeps us on track to do those things when we're Martha's, right? But the moment that it gets heavy and hard and our mind moves into that abnormal place of anxiety and worry because of the cares of this world, because of the cares of what we have been called to do as Martha's, then the yoke becomes heavy in, it, in its heart. Then it's no longer the will of God. It's no longer his yoke, and it's no longer his, his, his burden. But then it is our fleshly yokes and burdens, which are false responsibility. False responsibility then can cause us to operate in anxiousness and weary. So that question said, what are anxiety and weary? Anxiety and weary, which is what the author said, attacks on our mind intended specifically to distract us from serving the Lord. Okay? Now let's read the scriptures related to that. Okay? And then we'll move on to B and C. But let's just kind of touch on some of these scriptures. And that first one was Psalms 37 and 8. And that Psalms 37 and 8, and it reads, cease from anger. Now look at that again. That, that's another stronghold. That's a cluster. That's a demonic super stronghold, okay? Anger, anger in itself. The scripture Psalms 37, 8 says, cease from anger. What is anger being a super strong, stronghold? It can manifest itself in this way because the word says cease from anger. It can manifest itself this way. Hatred, malice, rage, murder, temper, cursing, vengeance, retaliation, violence, abuse, cruelty, Satanism, unforgiveness, bitterness, being judgmental or crucial or critical, okay? <laughs> being judgmental or critical, Taking offense easily, irritability, anger towards men or women, anger towards mothers, fathers, I say spouses, children, on and on and on. Anger towards the responsibility that we have. Anger towards authority, anger and resentment towards God. And I pause right there. So that scripture said, Psalms 37 and 8, cease from anger and abandon wrath. Do not fret, meaning be anxious or weary. It only leads to e evil. It only leads to evil. And this is the amplified version. Now, when we go back and it said, cease from anger and abandon wrath. He said, abandon wrath. What does that mean when we are to abandon wrath? We're to abandon it, what? Desert it. Divide by force from it. Reject it. Ne neglect it. Block intimacy with it. How would we do that? That means that we won't nurse it anymore. Okay? We won't, we won't nurse the wrath the seething in our hearts, the steeped in, in, in anger and resentment and bitterness, okay? We won't hold on to it. We won't be codependent on it. That's how we're going to abandon wrath, okay? Um, we're going to end the, 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 the negative demonic relationship with it, 
okay? We're going to burn that bridge, all right? That's how we're going to abandon wrath and not fret, not fear, which can only lead to evil, right? Because when you look at all of these things and these clusters that we spoke to, if those things are operating in you, there's no way that any good can come out of that. There's no way that any good can come out of anger and all of its functioning spirits that were mentioned, okay? So it's imperative when God said abandon, right? To, to sever, to desert, to divide from it by force and don't nurture that thing anymore. Don't allow that thing to operate in you in the area, you know, and manifest itself as unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment and, you know, all of these things that operate in our lives, you know, that can operate in our lives. Abandon it to what? To the fruit of the spirit, to the byproducts of the fruit of the spirit, which is love, joy. These are the things that we need to nurture. These are the things that we need to, to make covenant with. These are the things that we need to be in relationship with, within our hearts and within our minds and our spirits and allowing the Holy Spirit then to produce those things within us because we can't do it without him. That love, that joy, that peace, that goodness, that gentleness, that meekness, uh, that forbearance, that which is long-suffering, okay? And self-control, okay? Which are some of the fruit of the Spirit, right? That need, and all of them, all nine of them need to be manifested within us right okay and then that galatians 5 and 22 says and this is where we speak to the fruit of the spirit but before i read that scripture let me tell you about b let's talk about b and b says what is peace well simply b is a fruit of the spirit that's what we're talking about that's what we are to abandon wrath for, which that first scripture said. That first scripture, Psalms 37 says, cease from anger and abandon wrath. Do not fret, because it only leads to anger. And this Galatians 5, through 23, and I pushed it on to 23 because it speaks to all nine of the fruit of the spirit. But it said, one, here and be, what is peace? Because we are to operate in a place of peace. We are to nurture peace in our hearts. We are to be in covenant with that peace, the peace of God. We are to make the peace of God our umpire. Peace, we should operate in that because peace causes us to do what? Enter into the rest of God. If we have the peace in our heart, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, then Satan can't take away our joy, which is a part of the fruit of the spirit. And let's talk about that in that Galatians 5, 22, and I'm moving it, pushing it on down to 23. It says, but the fruit of the spirit, the result of his presence within us is love, unselfish concern for others, joy, which is an interjoy that the world can't give and the world can't take away. Peace, patience, okay? And peace in that patience, which is well, long suffering and forbearance, which is not the ability to wait, but how we act while waiting. That's that forbearance. That's that long suffering. That's that patience. Not the ability to wait, but how we act while waiting. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that's what that B speaks to. It speaks to the fruit of the Spirit, which of the fruit of the Spirit, peace is one of those. And the peace of God operating within us manifesting in us causes us to enter into a place of rest. And that rest is what the Sabbath of God, which is what we've been talking about. The Sabbath rest of God, which is a place of peace. Okay. And then C says, and Mary's, we will give you an opportunity to speak to this on next week, because of course this is a pre-recording. So, 
we want you to meditate on this when you listen to this and hopefully you'll be listen, listening to this now and you're in a place where you can then go over it and meditate on what's being said to you so that um, next week you'll have something to share about it as a Holy Spirit permeates your heart and you practice that place of peace and that place of peace being the Sabbath rest of the Lord. Okay, and so C says, how do we get the peace? How do we get the peace of God, right? All right, by abiding in the vine. By abiding in the vine, that's how we get the peace of God. Now let's move on to the next scripture, that John 15 and four. And that John 15 and four, and it reads, remain in me, and I will remain in you. What? Abiding in the vine. Remaining in the vine. Right? Okay. Remain in me. And I will remain in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit by itself. Without remaining in the vine, neither can you bear fruit, producing evidence of your faith, unless you remain in me. And we can take that a step further because this was Jesus speaking. And Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And I went further into that John, John 15 and 5, because it's important to understand what that looks like. And the author speaks here in the book and she said, and I'm going to read that, that John uh, 15 and 5 after I read what the, what the author said about this, where it says, you know, how do we get the peace of God? Well, by abiding in the vine. And Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And it said here in the book, it says, how long can a branch survive? This is a question means. How long can a branch survive if it is broken off the vine? How long can it survive? It says, when we abide in him, who is him? In Jesus Christ. We can enter the protection and rest of God. The life of abiding is a peaceful and restful and fruitful life. Enter in and enjoy life while God works on your problems. And here's the deal with that, that mirrors. When you read further in that 15 and five, it says, Again, I am the vine, you are the branches. That was Jesus talking. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For otherwise, apart from me, that is cut off from the vital union with God, with Jesus, you can do nothing. When you cut out, so what happens if you're cut out? If it's broken out, how long can it survive? It can't. It's going to wither up and it won't be able to produce any fruit. If you are cut off and you are not abiding in Jesus Christ, you are not abiding in his word, you are not abiding in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you then are cut off and there is no way that you can survive. You're going to ultimately wither up. Like when Jesus spoke to the, the fig tree that wasn't producing any fruit and it just appeared to be producing fruit, right? Because sometimes in our lives, mirrors, we can appear to be uh, producing fruit. But when you get up close, up close and personal, then you start to see that there is truly no fruit, but it appears to be fruit. And Jesus then spoke to that fig tree and he said, there will be no more fruit that will be produced in you because you appear to be doing something that you wasn't doing. And he caused that thing to dry up and it withered up. When we are cut off from the vine of Jesus Christ because we are not abiding in him, then we begin to wither in our spirits, in our souls. And that opens us up to what? An anxious and a weary mind that's steeped in so many other things, doubt and unbelief and all these other things that we made mention of. And that causes us to wither in our souls and in our spirits because we have been cut off from the vine. And if we are abiding in him, then we will be producing, uh, uh, 
the byproducts of the fruit of the spirit of which is what peace peace causes us to enter into his rest and be a fruitful and a bountiful place okay branches that are fertile branches that are nourished branches that are connected to the vine okay so that's important Mary's, that we understand that if we enter into the joy of the lord and allow him to work on our problems turn it over to him trust and believe that he can do it and that he's done it not that he's just doing it that he's done it thy kingdom come thy will done full stop thy kingdom come now thy will done full stop okay now let's move on to the next scripture and that is matthew 6 25 through 34 which also speaks to part a b and c of this question what are anxiety and worry what is peace and how do we get it which we spoke to that but these scriptures just really elaborate more on it so we're going to go ahead and read that matthew 6 25 through 34 which is going to speak to us even more about it and then philippians 4 6 and that first peter 5 and 7 so that matthew 6 25 through 34 and it reads therefore i tell you Stop being wearied or anxious. Now hear this, Mary's process this. Stop being wearied or anxious, meaning what? Perpetually uneasy and distracted about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body as to what you will wear is life not more than food and the body more than clothing look at the birds of the air see it means look at the birds of the air they neither sow seed nor reap the harvest nor gather the crops into bones and yet your heavenly father your identity ownership of us mares as children of God okay they neither sow sow seed nor reap the harvest or gather crops into the boom and he's talking about the birds of the air right now he said and yet your heavenly father keeps feeding them and then he says furthermore about us are you not worth much more than they what a question mark and who of you by wearying can add one hour to the length of your life and why are you worried about clothes see how the lilies and the wildflowers of the field grow they do not labor nor do they spin wool to make clothing yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory and splendor dressed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive, green today, and tomorrow is cut and thrown as fuel into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? you of little faith therefore do not worry and be anxious what perpetually uneasy and distracted saying what are we going to eat or what are we going to drink or what are we going to wear he said for the pagan gentiles those that believe and worship other gods the pagan gentiles unbelievers okay infidels the pagan gentiles eagerly seek all these things therefore marys we are to be separated we are to be set apart we are to be sanctified we are to enter into the sabbath rest of god 
and know that he is taking care of us. He said, because if you operate like the pagans, the Gentiles, the infidels, being eager, being, being eager, I said seeger, blending it together, being eager, seeking all of these things that the mind and the natural mind wanders and wonders to and wonders about. He said, they seek all of these things and we are to be set apart. We're not to worry, but we are to abound in our faith. He said here in the scripture, he said, but don't worry. For your heavenly father knows that you need them. He knows you need to eat. He knows that you need clothes. He knows you need a roof over your head. He knows you need transportation. He knows you need provisions to do the things that he has called you to do in this earth when you're mothers. He knows that. He said, but don't worry for your heavenly father knows that you need them. But first and most importantly, and this is also steeped in, in a scripture, Matthew 6, 33. But this scripture that I'm reading here, it says, but first and foremost, most importantly, seek, aim, and strive after his kingdom and his righteousness, which is his way of doing and being right, the right attitude and the character of God. And all these things will be given to you also. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble, trouble of its own. And that's what that scripture, uh, Matthew 6, 25 through 34 spoke to. And it just kind of broke that thing down to us as to why we are not to operate with an anxious and wearied mind, okay? Because our Heavenly Father knows what we need and he makes provisions for those things. But we are to do what, Mary's? We are to seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all other things will be added unto us. And what are the things? Those things that when we don't pray amiss or when we are praying the will of God or when we are asking within the will of God for his purposes and his plans in the earth and we are abiding in him, then he will provide. The provisions have already been made when we seek him. The byproducts and the manifestation of the needs that we have being met are steeped in that Matthew 6, 6.33. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all other things will be added unto you. Not the things that you desire if you are operating within your flesh and the acts of the flesh and your fleshly desires. But when you are operating in king, uh, that operating with the understanding that you have a kingdom mandate on your life. And that that is the things of the, uh, of the kingdom of God. That's the, king, the things of the Lord. Okay? All right. And so then that Philippians 4 and 6, and it reads, Do not, one more time, do not be anxious or worried about anything, but in everything, every circumstance and situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving continue to make your specific request known to god one more time mirrors when we're making our petition and our request known to god don't be disappointed don't be dismayed if you feel like he didn't answer go back and assess what you're asking him and is it his will is it the will of god how do we know the will of god is it going to advance the kingdom of god if it is going to advance the kingdom of god when you pray and you ask for the things you need he has already made provisions for what you need to get done, what you need to get done. And as a result of that, you will have a roof over your head. You will have food in your mouth. You will have clothes on your back. You will have the best that this life can even offer you, the abundant life. Because all of these things have been provided for us because of the, the, the God that we serve, who is our king. When we understand the kingdom mandate that is on our life, 
And we understand that we are king's kids. And we are not asking for selfish things. We're not asking for things that would cause us to operate in uh, Galatians 5.19, the acts of the flesh, the sensual nature, the dark nature. Those things that uh, we could default to because of being born into uh, this world of sin, a fallen world. But nevertheless, mirrors a world that had been redeemed by Jesus Christ with his blood, which causes us to be engrafted in into the vine and to be a part of him. Therefore, we would then produce so much fruit, bountiful fruit. We won't just have the appearance of yielding and bearing fruit, but we will truly be operating and bearing fruit. Okay? All right. So that's that Philippians 4 and 6. And then that First Peter 5 and 7 reads, what? Finally, casting all of our cares, all of our anxieties and worries on the Lord once and for all. Don't default, Marys. We can't default. We can't keep going back to an anxious and weird mind. He said, cast all your cares, anxieties, and worries and concerns on me once and for all. Let it be done. Let it be finished on him, for he cares about you. And then it was further to say, with deepest affection and watches over you very carefully. But here's the thing, Marys, do we believe it? Do we believe it? Or are we operating in a doubtful and unbelieving mind, which we covered in chapter 11? Which if we're operating in a doubtful and unbelieving mind, because we don't really believe that he cares about, about us with the deepest affection and that he watches over us and that his plans indeed are to prosper us and not to harm us, but to give us hope and a great future and a great outcome, that he wants us to have the abundant life, all that life can offer us, and that it is good, and that he breathed on it, and that he has, that, that he is a, a, a God that causes us to give birth and not abort, to be fruitful and multiply. Or are we operating in a place of doubt and unbelief, which causes us to have an anxious and weary mind, which is steeped in a super stronghold of fear. Fear that he will not do what he said. Fear that he doesn't love us with the deepest affection, that he doesn't watch over us carefully, and that he is not concerned about everything that concerns us. Fear. Fear that even the things that we have done before, even when he says that he has forgiven us, and that he has separated our sins as far from us as the east from the west and that everything that we have done have been cast into the sea of forgetfulness and that he remembers it no more. But we operate in a place, are we operating the conditions of our mind? Well, we really don't believe that. A doubtful and unbelieving mind causing the manifestation of anxiety and weary. So he said once and for all, once and for all, once and for all, Mary, once and for all, once and for all, once and for all, Mary, let's do it together. Once and for all, let's cast all of our cares on him, all of our anxieties, our worries, and our doubts, and our unbeliefs, our concerns, once and for all on him, because he does, he does care for us with the deepest affection. And he's watching over us. So once and for all, let's enter into the Sabbath rest of the Lord. Let's enter there with peace as a byproduct of the manifestation of the fruit of the spirit. That is a part of the gift that he has given us because the Holy Spirit abides in us and we abide in the vine of Jesus Christ and we won't let go. And we refuse to be cut off because of an anxious and weary and unbelieving mind, Mary's. Okay, so that's that. 
All right, so now let's move on to question number two. And we're gonna conclude with that question number two. And the scripture reference is Matthew 6, 25, and John 10 and 10. And it has a part A and a B to it. And the question says, according to these verses, and we're gonna go and read the verses, Mary's, but it says, according to these verses, that Matthew 6, 25 and John 10 and 10, how is life intended to be? How is life intended to be? Well, the author said life is to be of such high quality that we enjoy it immediately. There is no delay. That life in Christ Jesus, a life that is steeped in Christ Jesus, in that Matthew 6, 633, will produce an abundant life. And it will produce a life that where provisions have already been made for us and there is no delay, but it is now. Thy kingdom come, thy will done now. Thy kingdom come now, thy will done now. It is not something that is uh, deferred into the future. But life is to be of such high quality that we enjoy it now, right now, Mary's. Right now, immediately, okay? And that part B says, why does Satan attack us with weary? Why? Because he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he does. And that's in essence that John 10, 10 and 10 to steal our life from us. Satan attacks us with weary and anxieties because he desires to steal our life from us. Why? He's just simply doing his job. Okay? So let's read that scripture and what that scripture says about it, which it just said it. Okay? Matthew 6, 25 reads, Therefore, I tell you, stop being weary. Here we go again. Therefore, stop being weary or anxious, perpetually uneasy and distracted about your life. As to what you will eat, what you will drink, nor your body, as to what you will wear, and then is life not more than the body and clothing. Okay, it says what? Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? And that John 10 and 10 says, what does the enemy come to do? The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. But then I took it a step further in that. This is what we are to, to, to make sure that we understand. This right here, this is where we pause because we understand now what the enemy comes to do, right? He comes to steal our lives from us. But this word says, but I, Jesus, I came that they, who is they, that's us, may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. And it's not deferred into the future, Mary's. But it is now. Thy kingdom come now. Thy will done. Full stop now. Abundant life overflow. Okay? Right now. But with the mind of Christ. With the mind of Christ. With a life that is steeped in Christ Jesus, connected to the vine. Because we are, if we are connected to the vine, then we won't falter, we won't fear, we won't worry, we won't doubt, we won't disbelieve. But we will flourish and have the abundant life in the overflow. We will be full in flourishing. Our roots will run deep, a plant, uh, uh, like a tree planted by the, the riverside. 
deep roots running deep. Okay, Marys? So I am going to uh, just stop there with that question number two. And we pray that, you know, there will be something in this that you will be able to glean while you are having your devotional time and sitting at the feet of Jesus because this is a pre-recording for us. But we want you to take out time to really, really hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to you in this place. And that you go through the, the prophetic act of taking off the cares and the anxieties and the worries and putting on the mind of Christ and entering into his Sabbath rest in this place. So I'm stopping right there and I'll ask, um, you know, if Sister Arthur Minister Sarah, if you all had something that you wanted to add to that. If not, I know that um, we are coming to a close on this if you don't have it. Wow, there is so much packed in that. I mean, I'm gonna have to go back and listen to that again because you were you were hitting it, <laughs> you were hammering it, and even though you were going through the scriptures and breaking it down, there was just so much packed into that evangelist. Like I don't even know where to start because it was a it was it was a lot to actually chew on and meditate on. And as you kept repeating the piece about, you know, be anxious for nothing, you know, do not worry. And the reminder of if God will take care of the birds, if you look at them, like the author said, and observe the birds, like they run around, like they don't have a care in the world. Like they don't worry about if they're going to get food. They don't worry about if something's attacking their nest. They don't worry about it. If he will take care of, the birds and we are his beloved we are his children then we should automatically expect that if we are going to worry then why pray there's a song this is um pray and don't worry but if you're going to worry then why pray that worry like she was stating it brings and breathes doubt and unbelief so you get all entangled in all these emotions and these thoughts, and then it leads to you trying to figure out how you're going to solve it, how you're going to handle it. It just brings you so much torment and unrest when the word speaks to us being in spiritual rest, trusting God, having faith, complete confidence on him, knowing that if we're connected to him, we're connected to the, the life source, the provider, Jehovah Jireh, right? We have a lifeline. He didn't cut us off. So that means we can go to the Father and ask. He said the wealth of the wicked is put up for what? For the, for the righteous. So why are we worrying? Why are we being anxious? when it's clearly written what he will do. And I challenge you as you are listening to this, and even as Evangelist was breaking out all these different areas to make you really think. A lot of what she said should provoke thought. It should provoke you to stop, assess, really think about it. Think the thought all the way through. Don't start it and then get distracted. Bring your mind back in. Bring it back into discipline. Let's focus. Let's bring this thing into thought. And I also want you to think about all the times when you allow anxious, um, allow yourself to be anxious and worried. How did that make you feel? Where did that get you? You know, did it make your problem be solved any quicker? Um, you know, did you, were you not able to rest at night? Were you at unrest? Let's think about the times where you laid it at God's feet, where you trusted him, where you stayed connected, where you continued to make your time, your one-on-one -on -one time before him, when you took his word as the truth, when you just continue to seek him that you could stay even tighter into the vine not barely hanging on but that you got a full grip on there think about his record 
of the time when you actually let it go and you put it at his feet that he came through. Maybe for you, you might think that was at 1159. But God is a provider. Stay connected to the vine. Why be anxious? Why worry? Look at the word that we just went over. I mean, I, I keep saying this, but if she would have just probably stayed on question one and, and two scriptures, it would have been enough for tonight. Think about this. Let this be thought provoking. Really search your heart. Allow God to minister to you on these areas. And what areas are you worrying or being anxious about in your life? Again, let's find the root to this. Why? Is it financial worry? Or are you worried about financial lack? She mentioned in the beginning how these different things are attached to clusters. We'll be worried about fine, our finances, not never having enough lack. So we're always worrying about how we can get more, how we can take care of this. Will we have enough? That's not an abundant life. Because if we're always worrying, we're always having our mind filled up with those things, that just gives the enemy an opportunity to get in the driver's side and continue driving because it keeps you distracted from the word of God. It keeps you distracted from your God-given purpose. It keeps you from cultivating an even closer relationship. It keeps you from growing in your faith. It keeps you from growing in trust. It keeps you from maturing in the things of God because it keeps having you fall back to old patterns, old ways of thinking, old habits. So decide today that you want to no longer be anxious in these areas and that you're going to look at the root and ask God to show you, okay, I see this is the main root. What else is connected to this? Because this is this is just occupying too much of my time. This is draining. This is wearing me out. I'm tired of this. So, you know, that's my thoughts on that evangelist. I just encourage everyone just to re-listen to this um, recording and really take time to stop and allow God to provoke the thoughts. And as the thoughts are coming and you're becoming aware, decide if you are going to have the plan of action that is going to eliminate that way of thinking. So again, you could be victorious on this battlefield of the mind and continue forging forward. Um, Sister Arthur, I'm not sure if you had anything you want to contribute. Oh. Yes, I just wanted to um, share that it's just such a awesome feeling to just completely let go of that anxiety and worry. And it is so true that you have to go to the core and find out what the root of the anxiety and the worry is coming from. Because like the scripture says, you can't add or take away from anything. So all of it is, 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 not, is none and void that you worry and become anxious. And there's nothing that you truly can't do about it. You have to give it to God. Trust me, he will take care of every one of those needs. He will do it. I am a living witness that he will do it. And I just thank God for this part of the lesson. All of the lessons leading up until now has been so awesome in my life. I mean, I just sit here like, wow. I was just watching the birds this morning on my way to work. They have not a care. I mean, they're provided for because that's what God wants us to put ourselves in that place, to just totally and completely depend on him. And I tell you, it's, it's mind blowing when you just give it all to him and let it all go. Amen. Glory to God. I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that is really what it is. And it is a place of reflection. 
It's a place of reflection. It's a place of, you know, self-analysis. This is a good place, Mary's, for us to take our inventory, to do an assessment of ourselves in our minds, in the conditions of our minds. That Jesus Christ and his love for us is a reality, it's not a theory. It's not, it is a reality, it's not a theory. It's a reality, it's not a theory. His place of rest is a reality, it's not a theory. His love for us is a reality, it's not a theory. His deepest concern and his care for us and how he watches over us, like we can all really see those birds like Mr. Sarah spoke to, Sister Arthurlyn is speaking to. He loves us just that much. It's a reality, not a theory. Let's let him love us. Let's let him love us. And we can even say, Lord, teach me how to let you love me. Help me to enter into that place of rest with you, that I can take off all the cares of this world when we come on most times, we'll say, let's take off the day. But let's make it a practice, Mary, that we take off the cares of this world. That when we come on and we're sitting at the feet of Jesus, that we don't just have to find ourselves feeling the burden lift. But let's walk in and live in and operate in that place of peace with God. Casting our cares upon him. Because indeed he cares for us. Lord, we want to believe it and we want to trust it. What you say is true. Help our doubtful and unbelieving mind. There's a scripture that says that. Lord, increase our faith. Increase the faith that you've even given us because our faith can grow. It can. It's a gift from you. So, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity tonight. We thank you for this place of Sabbath rest and that you're teaching us how to sit at your feet and just be. Just be. All right. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father. So what we're going to do in this place, right where we are, we're going to give you an opportunity, Marys, future Marys, those of you that receive this Bible study in your news feeds, in you know, your YouTube, and it was in a lineup of messages because you've been listening and listening and listening. We want to give you an opportunity right now to receive Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. We want to give you an opportunity to cast your cares upon him and know without a shadow of a doubt that he cares for you because you want to be engrafted in and abide in the vine. You want him to take ownership of you and take care of you just like he takes care of the birds of the air. You want to turn your life over to him so that you can, you will no longer operate in a place of anxiety and fear and worry and doubt. Every demonic stronghold that have been guarding the gates of your heart and your mind, you can turn it over to him right now and know that he is God and that he indeed cares for you. Deliverance from all of these things are the children's bread. This is your opportunity to become a child of the high, the most high and living God. If you don't know him, this is your opportunity to know Jesus Christ and invite him into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. If you are in a backslidden state and you have been operating in a place of fear, anxiety, doubt, unbelief, worry, and the list goes on, this is your opportunity to hit reset. 
raise your hands in a stance of surrender with your heart. With your heart, a stance of surrender. And pray this prayer with us. We're going to read a scripture and then we're going to pray the prayer and you make it personal. Make it personal. This is urgent. This is urgent. Make it personal. Open up your heart to receive Jesus Christ. Into your heart as your Lord and Savior. Hit reset. Come back into the fold. Don't allow embarrassment, shame, logic, reasoning, rationalization to keep you and thwart you. Put you into a place where you feel like you can't come before his throne of grace. You can. You can. And you can do it now. Because he loves you. He loves you. Yes, he loves you. Yes, he loves you. He loves you with a deep affection and he cares for you. He even knows and counts the number of hairs on your head. Everything about you, he cares for you. So we're going to read the scripture and we're going to pray this prayer and we want you to pray it with us. Romans 10, 8 through 11, this is the scripture. Romans 10, 8 through 11, and it reads, the word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning the faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Anyone, anyone, anyone who believes in him will be never put to shame. Now pray this prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before your throne of grace in a stance of surrender with a repentant heart. I confess my sins and ask earnestly that you forgive me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. By confessing my sins and asking for forgiveness clears all legal ground that the enemy had against me. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I believe that you died on the cross of Calvary and on the third day you were raised from the dead. I believe that you transcended into heaven and now sitting at the right hand of God, making intercession for me. I believe that your blood paid for my sins, giving me the free gift of salvation and eternal life. I accept that free gift and I ask Holy Spirit that you would come into my heart and take up residency within me. Fill me with your love, with your truth, with your light and with revelation. Thank you, Jesus, for the benefits imputed to me because of what you did on the cross of Calvary, granting me full access to the kingdom of God. Now, I as well am seated in heavenly places with you, Father God, for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, and amen. Glory to God. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the word that went forth, Lord, tonight. We have been truly blessed. Again, I can't say it enough. Go back and listen to this. I am sure there's going to be something that you didn't catch. Just take time just to be still and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal some things to you. Well, Mary, we hope that you enjoy this just as much as I'm sitting here enjoying this. We look forward to seeing you the next Tuesday where we will continue in chapter 12. Now, 
I'm going to ask my dear sister Arthur if she would close us out in prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God. We thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord God, for this lesson, Lord God. We ask and pray, Lord God, that we would just lay down everything, Lord God, that so easily besets us, Lord God, that keeps us, Lord God, from entering into your presence, Lord. We ask and pray, Lord God, that you would just release our minds, Lord God, and our hearts, Lord God, from the cares of this world, Lord God, that we would totally, completely surrender all to you, Lord. Let us know, Lord God, that you are our provider and stand firm on that, Lord God. Let us stand up and say to the enemy when he's trying to distract us, Lord God, when he's throwing everything he could possibly think of, Lord, to take us off track, Lord, that you would just let us stand boldly and say, you will not take my peace my inner peace that God has promised me with anxiety and worry and shame and all those things, Lord God, that keeps us from totally and completely giving in and surrendering unto you, Lord. Be with us, Lord God. Continue to touch our hearts, Lord God. Let us be what you would have us to be completely unfaltering, Lord God. Thank you, God, for all that you are doing, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done and will do, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, with our whole heart. These and many blessings I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Sister Arthur, for closing us out in prayer. Marys, I pray that you will have an amazing balance to your week. May the Lord perfect those things that concern you. And we will see you next week when we pick up. Sorry. Yep. We'll see you next week when we pick up with chapter 12, moving into question three and four and maybe another one. But again, please feel free to share this with someone else. And if you have been blessed, we would love to hear your testimonies at hisministry at gmail.com. Have a wonderful evening. Love you. Bye-bye.